Hi, this is Cheryl talking with Christina Croft about her wonderful book, Most Beautiful Princess, a novel based on the life of Queen Victoria's granddaughter, Grand Duchess Elizabeth of Russia. Hi, Christina. Hello. I loved your book. Thank you. I love your books. It's an amazing story, isn't it? Yes, yes, it is. It's a truly remarkable story because this is a granddaughter of Queen Victoria who had married into the most opulent court in the world, the court of the Romanovs, and was renowned as the most beautiful princess in Europe. And yet, when her husband died, and she was still relatively a young woman at the time, she gave away every single thing she possessed to bring beauty to the lives of the poor by building the beautiful hospital, training as a nurse, and looking after the most abject patients, going out in the streets at night, picking up abandoned babies, and uh, child prostitutes providing them with a home and yet even though her life was more revolutionary than the revolutionaries she was murdered by the Bolsheviks in 1918 simply because she had been married to a Romanov. Prior to writing this novel you'd written a biography of Ella. What inspired you to do that in the first place? About um, 10 or 15 years ago I came across an article about Ella in a, a magazine and I was amazed when I read it, that I had never heard of her before, because I was familiar with the story of the murder of the Russian imperial family. But here was a woman who was a part of that family, and a very major part of that family, who seemed to be, whose life seemed to be written down as little more than a footnote in history. And yet it was she who brought Nicholas and Alexandra, the last Tsar and Tsarina of Russia, together. Alexandra, or Alex, was Ella's sister, and they actually met at Ella's wedding. But apart from that, Ella's own life was filled with amazing experiences. For example, her husband was murdered by a terrorist, and Ella went to the scene where his carriage had been blown to pieces by a bomb, and she picked up the parts of his body in her own hands um, before going to the prison and forgiving the assassin who had killed him. It was that, I think, that marked a major turning point in Ella's life. And from then on, as I, I said, she went on to give away all she possessed to care for the poor. But that being the case, her, her statue stands over the door of Westminster Abbey and thousands of people pass it every day. And I think, I wonder how many of them know anything about her. And at the time when I first read about her, I was looking for biographies of her because I expected there would be a few. But at the time, there was no biography of her published in England. So my sole aim in writing the book was to try and make her better known because I felt, and I still feel, that she is one of the forgotten heroines of history. And there are so many aspects of her life that are a great inspiration to people today. You decided to rewrite the biography as a novel. Why was that? When I was writing the original biography, I realized that there were many aspects of Ella's character that she probably never recorded anywhere. I mean, she was a, a very spiritual person, and I'm sure that she felt things very intensely, but didn't actually record all her feelings any more than anybody else does. For example, I'm sure we have all felt numerous emotions of fear and love or awe or reverence, and yet we don't write all of this down, and yet we have no doubt that we feel them. And in a, a factual biography, there's a constant demand for uh, recognisable sources. Everything has to be sourced and proved. And I felt found that very constraining, really. I think um, a biography is written very much from the head, whereas a novel can also be written from the heart. Um, and with somebody like Ella, who is a very spiritual person, I'm sure her experiences were very intense. And the more I began to read about her and learn about her and read her own letters, the more I felt I got to know her in a way that couldn't actually be expressed as I could prove that she felt this or I could prove that she felt that, even though I felt that I knew she did, just by tracing back the actions to the motivation behind the action to the thoughts behind the motivation. So I think there's a lot more freedom in a novel to create um, a fully rounded human being, making the subject much more accessible so that readers can empathise more fully. And that's what I hoped to achieve by writing the book. 
um, in a novel format. From the prologue of the book, we know of Ella's ultimate fate. Why did you choose to provide that information first? One of the first things I discovered about Ella when I first heard about her was that she was murdered in such a horrific way by the Bolsheviks. And it was that fact that led me to want to know more. And the more I learned, the more questions arose in me. For example, why did a granddaughter of Queen Victoria, a woman whom the Moscovites revered as a saint, meet such a terrible fate? Why, why was this most beautiful princess in Europe, why was she a nun? Why didn't she escape from Russia when she still had the chance? And how had she come from those glittering ballrooms, stunning every man in the room, to this terrible end? And the more I thought about this, the more it seemed that knowing the end of the story at the beginning creates the whole sense of where Ella's whole life was leading. In spite of the tragedy of the story, several people have commented upon feeling much better and uplifted after reading this novel. Why do you think that that's so? Oh, I am very happy if people feel that way, and I, I really hope that is the case. Because I think in spite of the, the very sad ending of the story and lots of sad events that happen throughout it, it's basically a story of beauty. The, the whole essence of Ella's life was beauty, first of all, her physical beauty and the beauty of her surroundings, to the spiritual beauty that enabled her trans to transform the ugliest parts of the city, the worst parts of Moscow, into a beautiful place. So I think it is essentially a story about beauty and bringing beauty into everything. And at the same time, even though her life was so tragically cut short in, in such a, a terrible way, in those 53 years she achieved so much. She had every, virtually every possible experience from the from the heights to the depths, she knew opulence and she knew absolute squalor of the slums. She knew wonder and awe and ecstasy, I would say, but she also knew despair. So hers was a very, very full life and one devoted to bringing, bringing about beauty. And I think that is an extremely uplifting thought. During her lifetime, Ella's marriage was the subject of so much rumor and gossip and Serge has been often portrayed as the bad guy. In Most Beautiful Princess, you present a more sympathetic view of him. Why is that? Unfortunately, I think a lot of very one-sided and superficial descriptions of Serge have been written. In numerous places I've read glib lines about, oh, Ella was very unhappily married, or Serge was gay, Serge treated her badly, and it all seems to be um, a very quick and in my view, mistaken judgment of, of him. No one is that one-dimensional. Ella and Serge were both very complex characters, but Serge has so often been made into some kind of one-dimensional villain rather than a very highly strung man desperately struggling to keep his frustration in check. And it's true that that frustration often resulted in outbursts of temper, but Ella loved him and she mourned him deeply when he died. And as I see it, it was the gossip and rumour that caused her far more pain and humiliation than anything that Serge ever did. Although you obviously love your characters, you've not shied away from presenting Ella's human flaws. You had no difficulty in doing that? No, no, not at all, not really. As, as a child, I read the lives of many canonised saints, and they were far too good to be true or, or even real. Ella wasn't a plaster cast image, she was a very real person with the same emotions that we all have. So I think characters are far more endearing and we can empathise with them more fully if we know that they are no different from us. In the midst of this very mo moving story, there are times when it appears that Queen Victoria provides the light, even comic relief. Isn't that surprising considering the general perception of her as a rather dour and unamused woman? Queen Victoria never fails to amuse me. I think she's absolutely hilarious and nothing like the staid old widow that she's often presented as being. I mean, she was quite narcissistic, really. Everything she felt had to be stronger and more deeper than anybody else felt anything. Her own marriage was the most blissful ever. Her sorrow, her mourning was deeper than anyone else's. And yet, at the same time, she was genuinely concerned and loving towards her granddaughters. All the same, I think she must have been a very difficult grandmother to have. She was such a busybody and always wanted to know every detail of what was going on in other people's lives. 
The novel is rich in descriptions that appeal to every sense. We can smell the scents of jasmine in the Holy Land or the explosives from the bombed carriage in Moscow. We can hear the music in the ballrooms, feel the icy wind, see the sun rising over the Moscova River. How do you go about creating these very sensual images that give us the impression that we're actually there? Mm, I don't really know. Um, usually things just come to me in an image or I sit and listen to music or look out the window at, in the night and the scenes appear before me like they're on a, a cinema screen. I don't know where it comes from. It's just like seeing a film and imagining yourself to be there and it just it just happens. <laughs> Are there any other members of Queen Victoria's family about whom you'd like to write a similar style of book? I have just completed a trilogy of books, the Shattered Crowns trilogy, uh, which follows the royalties of Europe through the First World War. And those books feature Kaiser Wilhelm, Queen Marie of Romania, and Tsar Nicholas, as well as the Habsburgs, Emperor Franz Joseph and Emperor Karl. And I think that they are quite similar in style, though they all made obviously a different series of stories. And I think anybody who enjoyed Most Beautiful Princess, I do recommend these as well. There are others that I'd like to write about too, possibly Prince Albert at some point, because I think he's a fascinating man. And also maybe even Queen Victoria's granddaughter, Moretta of Prussia, whose life, though nothing like Ella's, has its own drama in its own way, and that's just a possibility for the future. I loved Most Beautiful Princess and have read it twice and intend to read it again. I think it's the most beautiful book on Grand Duchess Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's been written. And uh, continued success. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.